As a physical science, astronomy makes use of several technologies, but all of them entail discerning and dissecting the light itself. And the reason why understanding the nature of light is so critical for astronomy, let's just think about some examples. So here is a star that you may have seen before. It's our sun. We can take a picture of it. We can see its surface. We can even identify some features on its surface. But except for the sun and maybe one or two of the brightest stars with the most sophisticated telescopes, we are otherwise only able to see just the light from the stars themselves. We don't get to look at their surfaces. All we can see are their lights. So what is light? Well, light travels through space in tiny bundles of energy, and these bundles of energy are called a photon. So the photons, regardless of what type of photon it is, always travels at one speed, and that speed is the speed of light. And this speed is represented by the lowercase letter c. Now in this model of the photon, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the photon behaves like a particle. In fact, in many circumstances, photons behave exactly like particles. But as it turns out, they propagate through space not as particles, but as waves. If we look at the peaks of the waves and measure their distance, and we consider the troughs of the waves and we measure their distances, those distances are both the same and we therefore call them the wavelength, represented by the lower Greek letter lambda. So it's simply the distance between the wave crests or the wave troughs, however you'd like to measure it. Now because this is a physical distance, we need to measure this in some fraction of a meter or something else. So we adopt usually one of two measuring units. The first distance we'll talk about, uh, the first unit rather we'll talk about is the angstrom. So one angstrom is equal to 10 to the minus 10 meters. Now keep in mind 10 to the minus 10 meters, that's an extremely tiny distance. That's one ten billionth of a meter. A second unit of measurement is the nanometer, which is only one billionth of a meter. So whichever one you'd like to go with, uh, we'll probably go a little bit back and forth on some of these but really they're just one and the same. One is merely a power of 10 uh, smaller than the other. So let's think a little bit about a photon of red light just coming along through space. If we take a detector and we try to count the number of waves that pass by every second, we get something called the frequency. It's signified by the lowercase letter f, and it's just a measurement of how many waves pass by per second. So for example, if we had just one wave cycle going by per second, we would call that one hertz, named after the gentleman who discovered this. Another way of expressing hertz is one over second. It's to symbolize one cycle per second. Now, suppose we had, in addition to our red a photon or our red light wave, we introduce a second light wave, this one's blue. If we bring our detector to measure the frequency of the blue light wave, you can imagine that since they're both traveling through space at the speed of light, we're going to count more of the blue wave cycles every second. In other words, the blue wave, the blue light wave, despite having a shorter wavelength, is going to have a higher frequency than the red wave. The red wave has a longer wavelength and therefore has a lower frequency. There are fewer red wave cycles passing through every second. So the key thing to remember here is that wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. That's just a nice way of saying the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency, and vice versa. Now if we want to express this mathematically, we just simply write this as the frequency is proportional to the inverse of the wavelength, or the wavelength is proportional to the inverse of the frequency. But if we want to get rid of the proportionality and turn this into an actual equation that just lines up and makes sense, we need to consider what is constant about both of these examples. And the thing that is constant is that they both travel at the same speed, the speed of light. Therefore, the frequency is the speed of light divided by the wavelength, and the wavelength is the speed of light divided by the frequency. So this brings us to a rather everyday example. 
You notice these rather large radio masts, and we now know the relationship between the wavelength of a photon and its frequency. Well, since 770 AM is broadcasting at 770 kilohertz, that's really the same thing as saying 770,000 hertz. And we can express that in scientific notation as 7.7 .7 times 10 to the fifth hertz. Okay, we can also rewrite the unit of hertz and express that as 7.7 .7 times 10 to the fifth per second. And the reason why we do this is because we can now take this value and plug this into our equation below. So the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. The frequency of this, of this broadcast is 7.7 .7 times 10 to the fifth per second. So the per seconds cancel, giving us a total value of 390 meters. It's no wonder that the radio masts need to be tall. Now the radio mast does not have to be exactly 390 meters. I mean, after all, it's capturing several different frequencies and therefore several different wavelengths of different photons at the same time. But it's got to be tall enough to capture enough of that wave so that it can effectively retransmit it to additional towers down, down the road that you can then eventually tune into and listen in on. Another property about waves is that they're often referred to as electromagnetic waves. Then the reason for this is because we are literally are talking about a composite of two waves, an electric wave and a magnetic wave. And as it turns out that these two waves are inseparable, they're co-joined and whenever an electro, uh, electric wave begins, it triggers a magnetic wave. And when the magnetic wave returns, in this case to the central axis, it triggers a new electric wave and so forth and so on. So the cycle repeats itself and this means that electromagnetic waves are self-propagating. They don't really need, once they get started rather, they don't really need anything to keep them going. They'll continue to traverse and propagate through space without any need for an external push, if you like to think of it that way. Now even though we can depict electromagnetic waves correctly as these two waves at right angles to one another, let's just refer to these as single waves, uh, like these for example. So here we have three electromagnetic waves, one with a wavelength of violet of 3800 angstroms, green at 5000 angstroms, and red at 7000 angstroms.